I believe the human spirit has a natural inclination toward compassion. Compassion with a need to intervene and make a difference is what explains the more than 100 million volunteers that have flooded the Gulf Coast since Hurricane Katrina slammed into the shore five years ago. Compassion is the only explanation I can find for someone like David Chung, who lived in a swanky condo in downtown Toronto. The PGA Pro played golf every day and played tournaments on weekends. In December 2006, he headed to New Orleans to help out because he liked the city's culture and its music. He had only planned to take two months off from golfing. But 14 months later, as one among many volunteers, he was living in a trailer in New Orleans, an upgrade from the gutted middle school where for nine months he lived barracks style, sharing a converted classroom with eight or nine other people on bunks as a volunteer. Compassion is the only explanation I have for someone like Jeff Parnes, who launched the New York Says Thank You Foundation as a way for New Yorkers to express the gratitude they felt in response to the outpouring of support after the 911 attacks. Each year on the anniversary of 911, Jeff sends volunteers to a city that has experienced a disaster to do something to help the city recover and rebuild. For example, on the seventh anniversary, Jeff and 300 volunteers helped rebuild a barn in Greensburg, Kansas, a community devastated by a severe tornado. Compassion seems to be the driving force behind Médecins Sans Frontières, known to most of us as Doctors Without Borders. Doctors Without Borders received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1999, and for good reason. On any given day, 27,000 volunteers are somewhere in the world bringing quality medical care to people caught in crisis, regardless of race, religion, or political affiliation. It operates independently of any political, military, or religious agendas. And 89% of its overall funding comes from private sources not governments. Doctors Without Borders is neutral. It doesn't take sides in armed conflicts. It provides care on the basis of need alone. The examples of compassion I have just provided are bigger than life people. They are heroes and heroines. Their stories are picked up by the news media and we are amazed at how they are driven to intervene during a crisis situation. In this morning's reading from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we also witness an act of compassion. An act of compassion in which Jesus was compelled to intervene during a crisis. Jesus and his disciples found themselves in nine a small village not far from the Mount Tabor, and whose name means charming in English. And as he and his followers were approaching the city gates, they encountered a funeral procession making its way out of the city. The custom was to bury the dead outside the city gates, close enough that they could still feel a connection with the loved ones who had passed on, but far enough away that people could move on with their lives. And when Jesus finds the circumstances of the, finds out the circumstances of the funeral, he is moved by compassion to intervene. It's the same compassion 
the same driving force that compels volunteers to respond to 911 or Hurricane Katrina or the Haitian earthquake. When we see human suffering, we want to do something to stop it. And Jesus was no exception. He was moved by the grief and the tears and the wailing of the mourners. When people we know lose their loved ones, we may cry with them or whisper support in their ears or hug them or all of the above. We want to somehow make it better, even though we know we can't. We want to wipe away the sorrow and tears. But the reason for his intervention went beyond just a desire to comfort this widow in her hour of grief. He knew, as did the widow, as did everyone else in the village, that the woman was now in a very, very vulnerable situation. Obviously, being a widow meant her husband had already died maybe years ago. And so her only means of survival would have been through the livelihood of her only son, the son who was now dead. Now, the most she could hope for was the occasional generosity of those around her, her friends and neighbors. As a woman with no means of livelihood in a male-dominated society, she no longer could count on anything anymore. There were no longer any guarantees in life, not even her next meal. I believe this is what drove Jesus to intervene in the situation. Even more than his desire to wipe away the woman's grief, I think Jesus wanted to wipe away her fear of a very uncertain future. And so he did what he was able to do. He brought the man back to life. And you and I are as amazed as the villagers were. We stand in awe of the compassion of Jesus put into action, just as we stand in awe of the compassion of the many global volunteers who every day are moved into action. We are amazed and a little overwhelmed because we're pretty sure that we won't be raising dead people anytime soon. And most of us won't even be raising a barn in Greensburg, Kansas, much less Waco, Texas. And those of you with medical backgrounds more than likely won't be putting your lives on hold to volunteer for Doctors Without Borders. And if we think about it too much, we may even slip into some feelings of inadequacy. We still experience compassion, but we feel inadequate. And so we find ourselves doing nothing. 